Hi, this is Larry Benko, W0QE, and this is a short video about how SimSmith can improve our understanding of RF circuits. I will use an article from page 58 of the February 2018 edition of QST Magazine as an example. The article was written by Joel Hallis, W1ZR, and titled, The 112th Wave Transformer May Be Just the Right Length. The information in the article is completely correct and describes matching a transmission line with, with surge or characteristic impedance Z1 to another transmission line with surge or characteristic impedance Z2, as shown in the drawing at the top of this page. In the middle, there are two pieces of transmission line that become the 112th wave transformer, and as you can see, the only transmission line impedances we need are Z1 and Z2. This circuit is a subset of a larger class of series transmission line networks without stubs, and it results in a narrow band match, a modestly narrow band match, when the sections are approximately one twelfth of a wavelength long each. And that's a number that's slightly variable based on Z1 divided by Z2, that ratio. We can use SimSmith to understand the circuit better very easily. And we can answer two questions that the author did not um, address in the original article. The first one would be the effect of loss in the transmission line on the actual lengths we need for the transmission line transformer. The second one would be, if we're going to cut transmission lines to put in this transformer, why do they have to be a 12th wavelength? If we're willing to make them be some other values, what matching range might we be able to accomplish with this transformer? All right, let's start off with a blank SimSmith circuit. We'll do the analysis at 10 megahertz. It doesn't matter really what frequency we pick. And let's try to match, say, 75 ohms to 50 ohms using the 1 12th wavelength transformer as described in the article. We'll use two pieces of transmission line. Each will be 30 degrees long. And for the moment, I'll make them lossless. This is the, the this parameter down here is the amount of loss per 100 feet at 10 megahertz. And this loss changes. Uh, primarily due to the um, this the skin depth uh, issues that you have with the uh, center conductor and the and resistance over frequency, and it tracks fairly well. Um, we can put a real we can go over here and put an actual piece of transmission line in that we wanted uh, if we knew what we were going to use. But for the moment, I want to show something with zero dB, so we're going to use just a simplified model. We'll copy that piece of transmission line. And we have two of them now. The second one over here will be 75 ohms, as was again shown in the article. 75 ohm uh, load, 50 ohm piece of transmission that matches transmission line that matches this impedance on this side. A 75 ohm transmission line impedance here that matches the number of the uh, transmission line impedance over here. No transmission line over here is shown. It wouldn't really matter. Uh, 75 ohm line in series of 75 ohms would still be 75. And let's look at this. We see something that looks to be we started 75 ohms, the pink arc is due to the T1, the green arc is due to T2, and we see our SWR as being very close to, to, to 50 ohms, which is right there. But let's move it to 50 ohms exactly. And I can drag this in SimSmith, provided I've got, uh, in the preferences, I've turned on drag tune, I've got the tune depth set to two. Setting the tune depth to three generally results in not good results. One or two are the, are the um, are the, are the places where you really want to set the value to be. And what I have right here now is a very good match. If I look up here, I see two pieces of transmission line that are just slightly less than 30 degrees. 30 degrees is 1 12th of a wavelength, 360 degrees being a wavelength. And as the article indicated, the number is just slightly less than that for relatively equal values on 75 to 50. And if I look, want to look down here, I can look at this square chart. And it shows the, the loss up here being virtually nothing because these were lossless pieces of transmission line. It shows the SWR bandwidth down here being very, very good. Uh, it's, this dotted line right here is 1.4 to 1 SWR, which is this circle I put on the, on the Smith chart. If we call 1.4 to 1 our SWR bandwidth, uh, we see it goes from about 3. Point, uh, a little less than 4 megahertz to a little bit above 14 megahertz. So while this is a narrow band match, it's a pretty broad narrow band match. And let's see what happens 
if we change the impedance to something higher. Let's say we go to 200 ohms here. We would need a 200 ohm piece of transmission line here. And of course, the length is wrong on both pieces of transmission line, as was, again, predicted in the article. And we see that the, that the 30 degree numbers, or just slightly less than 30 degree numbers before, now have dropped down to 23 degrees. Both these links are the same. I didn't quite get that point exactly lined up, but they're, they're actually the same if there's no loss in these pieces of transmission line. Now we go over here and look at the bandwidth. We see the SWR bandwidth is considerably narrow, narrower, and that's what we would expect. It goes from 8.7 megahertz to 11.1. .1. Still fairly broad, but much narrower. And that's, that's, that's very typical in circuits like this. The further we, the, the, the more different between the load and the source impedance, the narrower the bandwidth is. So this is all exactly as we'd expect. So the first question we, want, we wanted to ask ourselves, let's go back to the 75 ohm number for a minute. First question we we're going to ask ourselves was what effect did the any loss in the transmission lines have on the on the length of the pieces of on the on the on the lengths of those two pieces of transmission line. So if, if the transmission lines are lossy, let me get this very very close to being right. There it's cl extremely close. 29.33 29.34 degrees. And if I add some loss in here, say a half a dB per 100 feet at 10 megahertz. That's pretty much typical of 0.4 inch diameter type polyethylene coax. We see that we have moved from here to here. Now, granted, this is a very close, this is an SWR of 1.016. So for a lot of people, this is actually negligible. But nevertheless, loss does have an effect on the length. And if we move this back to be um, much closer to 50 ohms, we see that the the first piece of coax, the 50 ohm piece, actually got larger uh, than a, longer than a 12th wavelength, and the second piece got smaller. So they aren't the same length anymore, but they're still close to 30, uh, 30 degrees. Not a big deal, but to answer the question, there is a small difference. And if you were going, the difference between 5.6 feet and 5.2 feet is 0.4 feet. 0.4 feet is a significant amount when you're cutting the pieces of coax. Therefore, there's no reason not to do it correctly. Actually, if I was going to do this for real, I would put the real co the real transmission line that I was going to use in the in the circuit, and I would get even a better answer. But nevertheless, it, it, it's a significant difference. So that was point one. Point two was, since I'm already cut, going to cut a piece of coax, I don't care what length I cut it to be. So is, if I had a starting impedance, say, there, if that was a starting impedance, which is 77 plus J10, could I match that to 50? In a lot of cases, you're going to have an antenna out here, and the impedance will not be 75 exactly. In some laboratory environments, you might have a 75 ohm piece of equipment here, and it's very close to 75 ohms, and you, and you don't need to measure it or anything else to be able to build a circuit that matches. In that case, you're probably dealing with lower power levels, and you probably would use a different circuit than transmission lines. You'd use something that was broader band, like a small transformer. But at high power, this circuit works very nicely. And here, here we match this impedance, which was 77 plus J10, to again to 50, with 36 and 33 degree um, long pieces of transmission line. So you can, con you can continue on and move this point around all, all over the place and see where it matched. But we can do better than that. So let's go back to 75 for just a moment here. And we will do what I've done numerous times before, and that is to run the circuit backwards. This, let me go back in here and get this point centered on here again, just for grins. And I'm going to stay with lossy coax. It really doesn't matter at this point. Um, so the Smith chart programs in general start with the impedance over here, they apply the effects of the, of the component here, apply the effects of the component here, and, and SimSmith does the same thing. And even if you use an entire um, circuit block, like the ruse block or the N block, uh, it still applies the, the order of the, of the block going from left to right. We want to know, if we get a match over here, what was the load here? We want to go backwards. So we want to go starting at 50 ohms over here through the 
undo the effects of T2, undo the effects of T1, and see what the resultant load impedance was. So we do that very simply by changing the impedance here to be 50 ohms. We change the order of all the components, and we make their values negative. And when we do that, what we see is we started at 50 ohms, and the first piece of transmission line did this, the second piece did this, and our resulting impedance was 75. Well, that's very close. If I seventy five plus j point zero three. So now what I want to do is I want to adjust these values. Again, very easy to do in Sim Smith. I come down here, click on the name button, and I see the fields that I can sweep. We're going to sweep T1 and drag it down here. And we're going to sweep, sweep the length of T1 and T2 both. Now, they're not being swept yet, but they're, they're chosen down here to be able to be swept. The values I had here were modified, the links were modified here based on preferences I had set, and preferences I had set was a maximum and to minimum ratio of 4 to 1. You can put anything you want in there. 4 to 1 means that this value is one half of what the value here is, uh, what T1. This one's a value, pretty. it's 50% less, less than 50, or it's, ha it's half of this and double this pretty much. And um, this is T2 and this is T2. So 10.41 is double this number and 2.602 is half of this number. And let's turn the sweep on for both of those, both of these. Turn the sweep off on frequency and we'll set this to be in a sweep mode. This represents now the range of impedances from a 50 ohm perspective, which is the center of our Smith chart, that we could match allowing these ranges in lengths of transmission line. Now, if I want to look at this a little bit differently, again, this little black dot that you can let me turn this off and look at it with dots instead. And dots are done just with a plot command that says plot dots instead of the lines that you normally get um, for two sweep, for two sweeps. So right here we're at 75 plus J0 again. All these impedances around here we can match. If we want to look at it from a 75 ohm point of view, we can look at it from a 75 point ohm point of view, and it just changes changes the shape of everything a little bit and moves 75 ohms to the center of the Smith chart. And remember, the Smith chart contains every real impedance. So by moving the reference point around, you really don't change anything. But let's say I wanted to match all SWRs that would be out here from a 75 ohm point of view in, in, in the real circuit. Not, not, in this, not in this calculation, but in the real circuit. So I moved it to the center point, and I'm going to change the length of all of my transmission lines to encompass this circle. So we'll start here, and we move T1, and make T1 look, uh, a smaller value for the minimum value. We can see that the, the range starts to move down, and there we are. Now let's take the, the high end and move it up. And we see that we really didn't need to do much. It already cover, it covered the entire value it was going to get. So now let's look at T2. And on the high side of T2, there we go. So if we're willing to take T1 and make it, make it go from a little bit of, like basically one foot to 12 and a quarter feet, and T2 from basically one foot to 11 and a half feet, we can match all those impedances. Now, we might be able to might be able to do better. We know that a half wavelength, and the way I determine this, let's just put a temporary piece of transmission line in here. With a 0.666 velocity factor, a half a wavelength will give you a full rotation of of any of any impedance um, over the half wavelength. So 32.8 feet. So let's get rid of that and just remember the 32.8 feet. If we sweep these from 0 to minus 32.8 and 0 whoops, there we go, to minus 32.8 feet, this is the range of impedances from a 75 ohm point of view we can, we can uh, match to. Let's go back to a 50 ohm point of view because that's what the transmitter sees. We see something that's pretty, pretty much centered around, around the center of 50 ohms here. 
which is kind of interesting. It, it's, a, there's this, it's not circular because there's a little bit of a bump coming in here. And if we look at this a little more close, oops, we get a little more closely, let's drop the lengths of these down just a little bit and we start to see what happens as, as the length of T1 no longer is long enough. It's kind of, kind of, kind of mesmerizing. And we start to see that there are points, let's go back to lines because they show it a little bit better. These points out here actually have two solutions. All these have two, two possible solutions. As we can see, there's, there's, there's a, there's, well, it's hard to explain, but there's, there's two, let's, we back this off even more, we see it, we see it more. We see, we, we see basically a, two like circles that are overlapping each other as we come around. And same thing's true here. As we, as we make this lower, we eventually, eventually we get out to a point like about here, we only have one solution for everything. But there's nothing wrong with two solutions, although generally if you had two solutions, you would pick the, the solution with the smaller length of, uh, of lines. But this gives us the ability to, to, to adjust things quite a bit and uh, have, a, have a fairly, fairly modest match. Uh, if we wanted to have more of a match, there's nothing that says we have to use on this system 75 ohm and 50 ohm transmission lines. What if we chose this to be two 50 ohm transmission lines in parallel? That'd give us 25 ohms. Now look at our match match range. What if we chose to make this a piece of 75 ohm transmission line? Now we see a gap where we can no longer match. There's a almost an infinite number of ways you can look at this. But if you had an impedance at the load that was a certain value, say, such as that, uh, that 104 plus, plus J121, and you wanted to match to it, this circuit could this circuit right here could do it with a length of 22 foot length of for T1, which would be a 75 ohm piece of, tra of transmission line, and a 7.29 feet length for T2, which would be 25 ohm transmission line, which would be 250 ohm transmission lines in parallel. So anyways, I just thought I'd add a little bit to what was in the magazine article and show that Sim Smith can really help you understand how things work. Hope everyone appreci you know, appreciates the, uh, the value of, of Sim Smith. And if you like this type of stuff, please subscribe and, and click the, th the, likes, the thumbs up button. And I'll continue to make more videos.